Hey fun fans, Nick here and hope everyone is having a very successful Rescape build season as we're narrowing down to about four weeks left till the week one competition season. I'm back to do a quick highlight on team updates eight and nine as we progress through the build season and highlight four total Q&A questions and answers that could be proved to be important for your team to monitor throughout the build season as some of the most important questions to date. All of this and more coming up on this edition of FRC Updates Now. This video on fun is brought to you by our viewers, supporters, members, and also in partnership with the following. Kettering University's cutting-edge programs and their experiential co-op model seamlessly blend the professional and academic worlds, offering hands-on, future-focused learning that empowers students to pursue new ideas and inspires other institutions to follow their lead. Don't just be ahead of the curve, create the curve. Get more information at kettering.edu slash first. Go ad free and access our videos earlier when you support fun with a membership through YouTube Join. For $4.99 a month USD, you can now watch most of our YouTube videos ad-free and gain early access to scheduled content with other options also available. Click the join button below to get started. All right, well, let's jump right into Team Update 8. Um, big notion for Team Update 8, I was going to actually pivot this video to focus more on Q&A, but um, over the past week, Team Update 8 and Team Update 9 are two big updates that I think is important if you're not a team that happens to follow a lot of the team updates to really review and make sure that you're understanding because there's things that we're going to dive into such as radio wiring, um, updated practice field rules, and then some also bumper updates that we get in Team Update 9 that could be useful for your team to know. So jumping into Team Update 8, um, v, the VH109 essentially has a revised wiring requirement. So if you're not, if you're not, don't know to this point, first we'll be using the new Vivid Hosting um, FRC radio that was uh, utilized at the championship last year for all events this coming season. So first we re released a statement that said, first and Vivid Hosting have received reports of Rubo Rio Ethernet ports heating up significantly when connected to a VH109 radio powered only through the 12 volt input terminals. While some heating is expected, these reports indicate heating significantly beyond what was observed in multiple long-term tests at first and Vivid Hosting. The changes to R703 mitigate this issue by requiring configurations that will not result in 12-volt power being applied to the RoboRio Ethernet port. The first wiring documentation has been updated to reflect this change. Vivid Hosting is working on a tutorial for making the appropriate adapter cables. So, we'll dive into that in a little bit more, but General wanted to make sure that that was highlighted. Big thing, um, G419, anchors are off limits. Um, originally, if one of your Alliance members um, contacted the anchors or the chain on the cage while they were trying to climb, it made your entire Alliance ineligible for the barge RP. Um, there was some communication about this on Chief Delphi and first had come out and said essentially, hey, um, it only makes that robot ineligible for cage points. It doesn't make your entire Alliance ineligible for the barge RP. So big win for first on that one. I think this is what their intention of the rule and they did a good job by rectifying that. The important thing to note here is that it does not directly call it the robots not eligible for park points. So if you have two robots that attempt to climb and one of them gets a deep climb and one of them hits the anchor while they're climbing, I still believe that you're going to um, get that barge RP. But be sure to consult the official manual and team updates as well as the official Q&A um, for the official answers on that. Uh, we're going to jump down to R626, which is an added rule for this team update, the VH109 PoE pass-through. And this reads that the VH109 PoE output may be used only under the following conditions. So the PoE output on the robot radio can only be used in the following conditions. The device is a powered COTS device or COTS adapter connected to a single COTS device with the current draw less than or equal to 2 amps at 12 volts. The connection is being made using standard CAT 5E 678 cable. Or the VH109 is powered using the 12 volt input terminals with 18 gauge wire or larger, and it may additionally be powered using the PoE input if desired. So essentially, you're only allowed to use the PoE pass through um, if it is under these following conditions. So if you're a team that was planning on using the pass through and not following these conditions, be sure to adjust your wiring um, use case and make sure that your robot is within the bounds of the rules for this coming season. Uh, they also added B and C to R703, which calls out the port labeled Rio of VH109 radio via RPM, passive PoE injector cable, or adapter, um, or an Ethernet cable with the appropriate wires was removed on the rubber rear end. All wires or adapters used must be fully insulated, so be sure to follow that as well. Um, and then the port labeled aux on aux 2 of a VH109 radio with the corresponding DIP switch in the off default position. So, if you're not using the real port on the VH109, it's strongly recommended to cover the port to prevent accidental damage to devices such as laptops which may occur if attached to this port. So. If you don't use the real port and you happen to plug your laptop into it first essentially saying hey you might want to make sure to cover that port because it could cause accidental damage to your device um practice areas so one thing that they noted here um especially at the championship the past couple years is um there's been an increasing amount of injuries happening on the practice field whether that's due to you know tethered robots that are trying to operate autonomously or 
um, you know, folks just being in a bad situation. So first comes out and says teams should not relocate elements from their original locations. The layout is specifically intended to discourage teams of complex auto routines. So my gut is first is going to say, hey, this is how you're going to set up the practice field. And it's essentially going to make it, you know, impossible or nearly impossible for teams to run complex autos um, on the practice field. They want to bring down that amount of injury um, to, you know, patrons that are on the practice field. So be sure to prepare for that. Um, if you're a team that doesn't really get to get on a field before the competition and you want to get some auto routines, a lot of teams around the globe have their practice fields open to the public. So I would recommend reaching out to your local program delivery partner or checking out Chief Delphi to see if a team around you has a practice field available for you to get on before the competition. Um, they also added that first is providing a minimum of one crosshatch pattern algae, which is representative of the algae used on the competition field to the practice field, and teams may not damage or remove from the practice areas. As well as human players are welcome to practice throwing algae into the practice field net as long as the area around the barge is clear of robots and to avoid and humans to avoid missed shots hitting people or interfering with robot testing. So overall, first just adding some language in there to you know hopefully um, increase the uh, amount of safety that is being taken around the practice field. Jumping to team update nine. Um, the inspection checklist is available officially on the um, Season Materials webpage. So this is essentially the checklist that teams are going to be jumping through this year to, um, you know, review on how to pass inspection. So one of the good things might be is to take a look at this inspection checklist, review it, see if your team's in accordance with all the rules that you believe to be, so that way when you get to competition, there's not really any surprises for you. Um, bumper rules. So this is an interesting one. Um, and, you know, my team actually, Team 33, asked a question about this, but... Um, this R411 had originally um, was written as services of the bumper, other than the following are prohibited. So this implied essentially anything attached to the bumper. It was highlighted that it's the services of the bumper cover, that contrasting markings are not going to be allowed on the bumper cover. So theoretically, if you had something attached to your bumper that was contrasting in colors, such as a sponsor panel or whatnot, it is our interpretation and my interpretation that this now essentially makes extending your backing material to add you know some sort of sponsor panels or team logos to um, legal because it is directly influenced um, not on the or it is on the bumper backing rather than the bumper cover so if you're a team that's pushing weight and might need to offload some of your weight of your body panels onto your bumpers because you have weight in the bumper you might want to take a look at that um, but I would ultimately you know refer to you to the official Q&A the official gaming and the official team updates to um, make the decision for your team but that is currently my interpretation um, jumping down into measurement um, they essentially just highlight humans may uh, touch a scoring element but may not practice with it e.g. through algae or anything resembling algae or the coral station um, during the when the arena is open for measurement so um, essentially make sure that you're following that you're allowed to touch it but you're not allowed to practice with it throwing anything resembling to algae or using the coral station so be sure to take a look at that okay jumping into a couple of Q&A questions that I've highlighted that I think were important for your team to know contacting an anchor uh, asked by FRC 3984 five days ago and answered yesterday by the GDC in the answer to Q9 you said that G419 only grants exceptions for contact with an anchor that is momentary and in, in consequence inconsequential but I am looking for clarification if a robot has completed a climb either deep or shallow and the robot swings such as a part of it makes a momentary but possibly repeated contact with the anchor chain due to swinging with the count climb we cannot comment absolutely on hypothetical scenarios but the ultimate decision will be determined by the referee's ear event with the final call made by the head referee G4 Titan first goes on to state that G419 states that the robot may not contact the anchors generally the momentary exception during inconsequential contact is considered individually for every instance of the contact rather than multiple contacts put together However, teams should be aware that climbs are evaluated and scored by human volunteers, and it is possible that a series of contacts could appear as one greater than momentary contact. Teams are encouraged to make sure that it is obvious and unambiguous that the scoring criteria is met. So I think the goal of this is essentially, hey, if I'm climbing onto a shallow cage and I'm in the air, but my robot's swinging and I'm hitting the opposing anchors to the left and right of me, um, is my climb going to count? And I think first is saying, hey, we're going to treat each um, individual instance as... Um, you know, its own instance rather than multiple contexts put together. So I would believe that that would be, um, you know, essentially inconsequential and therefore, you know, the climb would count. But again, um, I would recommend that teams try to design their mechanisms around the fact that uh, minimize the swinging so that way you're never touching an anchor at all, just to essentially remove that line of human error possible um, within the rules. Jumping to question 106, uh, we're running power for the VH109, so kind of hitting on the team update that we just read in team update 8, talking about the updated wiring to the robot radio. 
Um, the FRC 548 goes on to ask, the recommended wiring diagram provided by Vivid Hosting for the VH109 radio shows the radio powered by both PoE and the Weedmuller terminals with power source from two separate channels on the PDH. R621 states each branch circuit must be protected by one and only one circuit breaker or fuse. Is it acceptable to wire two power inputs with VH109 to two separate channels per the manufacturer's recommendation? Or must all sources of power for the radio come from a single channel? Um, first, apologies for the delay because this took about 11 days to answer, but the VH109 may be powered using both the PoE input and the 12 volt terminal input from separate channels of the power distribution device. So, looking at that recommended um, wiring diagram from the manufacturer of Vivid Hosting that is still legal, you are allowed to power the robot radio using the PoE and the 12 volt terminal input um, from the separate channels of the power distribution device that your team is utilizing. Jumping to question 113, asked by FRC2177. Um, can 4-inch thick bumpers extend fully into the corner, creating a diagonal measurement from the corner that is greater than 4 inches, or is this illegal per R403, forcing the bumper to be radius to maintain that 4-inch measurement from the corner? Likewise, can a 1.25-inch thick hard parts bumper backing material extend into the corner such that the diagonal measurement is greater than 1.25 inches, or is that illegal per R404 facing the hard parts to be radius to maintain the 1.25 limit? First goes on to state that yes, the padding and hard part measurements should be made perpendicular to the frame perimeter edges or an imagined extension of them into the corner, such that a legal bumper can be extended into the corner without requiring parts being radius. So essentially saying, hey, yes, you should treat the padding and hard part measurements and the measurements of those specific padding and hard parts should be made perpendicular to the frame perimeter edges. First also goes on to state that please be aware of the exception of the minimum padding area described in R406, which should be manually measured radially from the corner as shown in figure 8.6. So as we gear up here, robots are starting to get finished from teams. They're starting to think about, hey, we need to have bumpers for our competition. Be sure to look at R406. Be sure to look at question 113 more into detail. Be sure to take a look into R403 and all of the new bumper rules this year. We highlighted it in a previous video about the updates to the bumper rules, but if your team is just now watching for the first time, one, welcome, and two, be sure to take a look at the updated bumper rules for this coming season. Jumping into our last question, the avatar submission. One of the cool things that first brought back, I believe it was in 2017 or 2018, um, was the team's ability to submit their own avatar to be used while at competition on the scoring screen. Um, this, you know, FRC 5514 asks when will the 2025 avatar submission system open, which is at the following link. And they do note that the scope of this Q&A system includes and is limited to questions about game manual awards and field drawings, and to please contact team support. But first did just release a blog, um, I believe it was earlier this week or late last week, that the FRC avatar submission for 2025 is officially open. So be sure to check out the blog, take a look into the requirements, and I'm excited to see what teams come up with their avatars for this year. That's all for this episode on FRC Updates Now. Thanks, everybody, for joining today, and I look forward to seeing what teams are coming up with here in a few short weeks as we approach week one of the competition season. I'll be at first in Michigan District Ferndale week one, so if you see me, feel free to stop by and say hi. Thanks, everyone. Kettering University's cutting-edge programs and their experiential co-op model seamlessly blend the professional and academic worlds, offering hands-on, feature-focused learning that empowers students to pursue new ideas and inspires other institutions to follow their lead. Don't just be ahead of the curve, create the curve. Get more information at kettering.edu first.